Vice President Nixon escorts Soviet Premier Khrushchev on a preview of the United States Fair at Skolniki Park in Moscow. It's the official opening of the American Exposition, counterpart of the Soviet trade show in New York, and dedicated to showcasing the high standard of life in our country. But on this occasion, traditional diplomacy goes by the board, and the story of the fair itself is eclipsed by a crackling exchange between Nixon and Khrushchev, begun off-camera and finished off before the American Ampex color videotape recorders. Every aspect of the Cold War and Soviet-American rivalry is argued in blunt and forthright terms. The threat of atomic warfare, diplomacy by ultimatum, economic progress. Says Mr. Key, the Soviet will overtake America and then wave bye-bye. Both Khrushchev and Nixon appear to enjoy themselves. Says Khrushchev, he is a communist spokesman dealing with a capitalist lawyer. All that, all that I can say from the way you talk and the way you dominate the conversation, you would have made a good lawyer yourself. <laughs> but the culmination is agreement that both nations should hear the startling debate uncensored. All of these Sure, it wasn't. <laughs> so anyway, welcome you back. Of course, History 2023, Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you are doing great out there uh, this week, of course. So anyway, yeah, we're in the home stretch. Uh, I got this week, of course, and next week left, of course, uh, before we get to, of course, our final exam. So yeah, we are getting, getting of course, down the road uh, for that. Uh, of course, we don't have too many lectures up. We got, of course, today's lecture, of course, and I'll probably have two more lectures, of course, next week, of course, that are going into the final. So anyway, it looks like uh, Ross right now is watching right now. I don't know if anybody else is watching out there. I think, it's, I think there's one more on there right now to see, but uh, if anybody else is watching live, let me know, of course, uh, who you are. But um, so anyway, uh, kind of get started today. Uh, just, of course, a few reminders about, of course, this week that are kind of important. Oh, uh, y'all do still have that uh, second exam uh, that's still out. Uh, that's going to be out for probably a few more days. Uh, I will extend it. So I don't know if a bunch of you have kind of finished that yet or not. Uh, I know Ross has finished it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but um, so yeah, if y'all haven't finished that yet, get that done. I'll, I'll probably maybe leave it open a few more days till Sunday or Monday uh, for you to get it done. But that's something you do need to, of course, get done uh, pretty much out the way. Because, you know, after that, I'm probably going to give you a final, you know, I don't know if I have time for other quizzes I want to do. Uh, it's to it's kind of compact schedule, you know, with these shorter classes. Uh, so y'all's final exam, I think I, I kind of sent out a thing about that, but it's likely going to be mostly like World War II to the present. And I think it's probably what I'll probably concentrate on trying to give y'all uh, toward the exam uh, and all that. So anyway, uh, I also don't forget, I don't know if anybody else is doing that uh, Veterans uh, Oral History Project, but uh, I think the due date for it, uh, it's May 1st, so don't forget about that, getting that to me if you're doing that, because that's worth a lot of bonus points. Also, if you're in the seven weeks class, I believe it is, American History uh, research papers, of course, are due uh, starting this weekend. Uh, so you kind of try to wrap those up and get those to me. Uh, if any other, of course, other students have not turned it in, of course, previously, you know, get that to me uh, as soon as possible. So you can, of course, get credit for that. So anyway, uh, in today's lecture, like I said, I'm going to talk about kind of a continuation of the Cold War, mostly kind of talk about, we're going to get into like the early 60s today, uh, I'll kind of talk about mostly Eisenhower's administration. We're still in that. We haven't finished that yet. Uh, I'll talk about Eisenhower. Then I'll get into John F. Kennedy's administration. Uh, as well. I'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, he's not around long because you know what happens to him, of course. Uh, he gets assassinated, which I will talk about today as well. Uh, so that's about all I'll probably I'll do today to wrap that up. And then next week, I'll kind of go from like the 1960s to whatever I can do close to the present. That's pretty much what we'll do next week as well. So if you have any uh, comments, questions about this lecture, uh, you know, during the live stream, let me know. Of course, of course we can answer this real fast for you. Uh, and then, of course, uh, later on, you can, you know, send me any kind of comments, questions. If you have something other idea you've got, course about this lecture of course or about you know previous ones before 
So uh, I think last time we were kind of, we had gotten up to like the Eisenhower era. Uh, we were kind of talking about all the, the foreign policy issues that Eisenhower was having to deal with, like whether it be the Hungarian revolution or the Suez crisis that was going on. I think that was around like 1956, you know, which the Cold War kind of peaks around Kennedy's time, I guess, and Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, and uh, so um, anyway, uh, I want to go ahead and first talk about, of course, um, the um, I guess the first thing we'll talk about is really uh, the issue with I kind of mentioned before about the whole Berlin crisis that's actually going on between like the time Eisenhower's in power uh, going all the way up to like Kennedy. So you got this issue with uh, the Berlin crisis. Uh, that they have. Khrushchev, I think I mentioned before, was threatening to basically take over West Berlin if the United States didn't withdraw their forces or withdraw their nuclear weapons, uh, which we have, think, over there in West Germany uh, at the time. Uh, and so um, that's kind of an issue that that's big, you know, that occurs uh, when Eisenhower's still in power. And then Kennedy, of course, comes in later, uh, a little later. Uh, and um, if you know about it later, which will kind of show you kind of what happens later in 61, but uh, at one point, you know, you get this deal where uh, both sides are facing each other off uh, at what is like really where um, I guess the border between where the two sides, you know, occupation zones were. You have what they call Checkpoint Charlie. This is like later in 61, but eventually that's one of the things that's going to happen later that you'll have. And uh, there's kind of this standoff, you know, that's kind of why the Cold War is such a, you know, like this military standoff between both sides. Uh, and it's going to later lead to the building of the Berlin Wall, uh, which really won't be built later. But Berlin Wall is not built till 1961, but it'll, it'll be up, you know, for almost 30 years, uh, which helps to kind of divide, you know, the West from the East uh, and all that. Well, Khrushchev, um, which we had talked about before, um, he actually, uh, if you know about the story about Khrushchev, uh, he actually, um, uh, to smooth over differences with, with the West, Khrushchev agreed in 1959 to, to actually come to the United States and, of course, meet with, you know, President Eisenhower, which he did. And this is actually done, I think, it was in September of um, 1959. And Khrushchev actually visited, um, part of why this happened, if you know about it, was uh, there was this incident that happened at what is called the American National Exhibition, which was being held in Moscow. The United States is kind of showing off all its American technology, and uh, they were in like some kind of kitchen, like a modern kitchen, like, like in America. And uh, Nixon and Khrushchev started arguing over, you know, what's better, you know, the United States you know, in their economy or, or of course, uh, Soviet Union uh, and all that. And so that became a big, big difference between the two. And it, of course, became known as the so-called kitchen debate. I'm not sure if they ever showed all that in the Soviet Union, like they said they were supposed to. I bet they probably did not, as far as I know. Uh, but that was something that Nixon was involved in. I think Nixon was kind of very anti-communist. He didn't really like the, like the Soviets uh, much. With that, and there's of course a picture of Nixon on the right with Khrushchev on the left. Khrushchev was kind of like this buffoon, you know. He's kind of like this country farmer kind of guy, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and um, I think later the Soviets, you know, would sack him uh, as their main leader. Hey, what's up, Jennifer? What's going on? Hope you're having a great, great afternoon. Of course, with that. So yeah, that's that's part of why you know, uh, you know. Khrushchev decided to come to America, which uh, the dates for it, by the way, he was here for about 13 days uh, from September 15th to the 27th. And yeah, it was like a media circus, like everywhere he went, the, the news media followed him all over the place. Uh, and uh, it was like basically considered one of the first state visits by a Soviet leader you know, that they'd ever had. So that's because it's why it was kind of like that, uh, more or less. And he went all over the place. Like he visited Hollywood, if you know about this. Uh, and uh, like he saw like Marilyn Monroe and a bunch of other famous, you know, actors at the time uh, in Hollywood. He thought that was great. 
Uh, and then if you know what happened, uh, when he was in Hollywood, he was like, hey, I want to go see Mickey Mouse. <laughs> you know the story about that. He wanted to go uh, to Disneyland, you know, see Mickey Mouse. I demand to meet Mickey Mouse, I think is what he said. I oh, that was kind of a joke there. Uh, and, of course, they turned him down. <laughs> it you know, happened uh, with that. Uh, he did visit a farm in uh, Iowa. Story about that. Of course, Khrushchev, uh, which I think that was his probably most famous thing he did that he liked a lot because he liked swine farms or something like that. I don't know. Like they had in the Soviet Union. Visited Pennsylvania farms there. And I think he also met with Eisenhower at Camp David, uh, which is, of course, uh, in Maryland. So those are kind of some of the things that, you know, uh, he, he did uh, Khrushchev when he came here. It looked like we were going to start to be kind of more buddy-buddy uh, the United States uh, in the Soviet Union. And uh, there was even a deal where uh, I think he, he was planning some kind of uh, summit meeting where we were going to meet them again, like in Europe, or maybe I think they were going to come to the Soviet Union, uh, like maybe Eisenhower was going to go there, meet with him or something like that. But there was an incident that happened that became very famous in the Cold War, which you may have heard about, which was this famous U-2 incident happened, which was on May 1st, uh, 1960. Uh, and what happened was the United States, we had a spy plane, which is called the U-2 spy plane, uh, was shot down uh, over, the, over the Soviet Union. Uh, we had been spying on it for a bunch of time, time period, of course, under Eisenhower, which the CIA was involved in it. Uh, and we thought the pilot was dead, uh, which was, of course, this man named, you can see there, Francis Gary Powers. He was actually captured uh, by the Soviets, I think, and held by them for like a year or so. Uh, and eventually we exchanged him with like one of, uh, like a Soviet spy that we had, I think, in prison, uh, more or less. So that incident is actually kind of important because if you know much about the U-2 incident, it actually worsened and it worsened tensions like between us uh, and the Soviet Union, uh, which would continue later under John F. Kennedy. We kind of get worse, you know, up to if you know about the Cuban Missile Crisis, that'll kind of peak in 1962. So obviously the U-2 incident was something that really uh, did not exactly help the situation uh, in the Cold War. <laughs> happened happened on May 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 Day, I think they call it right. And in, in, it was a big big day. I know the Soviet Union uh, when it happened. So then he got shot down by one of those SAM missiles. You know that's how how he got shot down. But he was a CIA pilot. Uh, powers. Uh, going back to Eisenhower, a few more things about him before I kind of move on uh, to talk about John F. Kennedy's uh, period. Uh, there's a few things that happened under Eisenhower that I did want to mention about, which are famous today. And I'm sure some of you have probably heard about this before. Uh, if you know about Eisenhower, he's the father of the so-called uh, federal interstate highway system. That's something he's known for because well, they had a so-called Federal Aid Highway Act uh, that came out uh, in 1956. Uh, and um, Eisenhower... Uh, had been influenced, by the way, by the Autobahn, uh, which, you know, Adolf Hitler had developed in Germany, Nazi Germany, which created a kind of a highway system they had in Germany. And so he thought that they needed something like that in the United States. We had highway systems that kind of went back, I think, to the early 1900s as automobiles were being developed. But really starting, I guess, by the 1960s and 70s, they started building interstate systems all over you know, the United States. And of course, in Louisiana, we have like what I-10, I-12, I think are a big, big interstate. I know I-10 is the big one running through, of course, Louisiana today. Was it I-20, I think, in the north? I think it is northern part of Louisiana uh, that they have as well. And so a lot of people do call it now the Eisenhower Interstate System, which was kind of, you know, named after uh, him and all that later. So Eisenhower is the so-called father of the federal interstate highway system. Uh, another thing that's famous that happened under him, you may have heard about uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower was one of the first uh, presidents to try to enforce the desegregation of American schools, which, you know, pro previously before that, most schools in the United States were divided like black versus white. I think everybody kind of knows that going back a long time ago. 
uh, and all that. And so uh, one of the first uh, schools he desegregated was a school, of course, I just have on the screen, which was the Little Rock Central High School, which was in Arkansas. This happened in 1957. It's kind of one of those early things that was part of the civil rights movement, which I'll get to the civil rights movement probably later, maybe next week. I don't have time yet to do it today. Uh, we'll get to it later. Uh, but apparently the governor of Arkansas, his name was Orville Faubus, refused to integrate Central High School uh, in Little Rock High School, Little Rock, Little Rock Arkansas. Uh, and so um, what, what Eisenhower did, if you know about this, he brought out the uh, 101st Airborne Division, like basically the U.S. military, uh, to basically allow these African-American students to go to school. Uh, and you can see there's there's the so-called Little Rock Nine, of course, that are, of course, in that picture right there. So that's all because of that famous uh, court case they had, the Supreme Court had, which was the board versus uh, uh, Brown of Topeka, Kansas. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that later. Uh, that helps to really, you know, begin desegregation of the United States. Uh, that's something that basically uh, you see pretty much everywhere. Uh, that's part of why Baton Rouge Community College, by the way, was created. It was actually created because of a desegregation suit where Southern University and LSU were mostly segregated. Southern's mostly black, LSU's mostly white. It was this idea to create a community college which would mix, you know, black and white students together, you know, and all that. That's the point of why they did it. Most people don't know that. But anyway, but yeah, that, that's what they call the so-called Little Rock Nine, you know, is what they called them, of course later with that. Oh, one more thing about Eisenhower I did want to mention, uh, which is true uh, as well. Uh, under Eisenhower, also uh, the last um, two states came in. Alaska and Hawaii joined in 1959 uh, to become the, you know, part of the so-called 50 states we have in the United States. And that's why the United States flag has 50 stars on it, of course, because of that. All right, let's go ahead and move on. I want to talk about next uh, the uh, 1960 uh, presidential election that, of course, comes in. Uh, that's very important uh, that we have. Uh, and, of course, you've got um, – let me move this up here a little bit so you can see a little better. But uh, you got also, of course, two, two men running, of course, against each other uh, in 1960, which, of course, are – You've got John Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Uh, of course, one of the most famous, by the way, presidential elections uh, in American history. Uh, it's also a very close election, which we'll see also later as well. And um, so you got these two men running. You had Richard Nixon, of course, was from California. Uh, he was a Republican. Uh, he was the vice president, of course, Hunter Eisenhower, who was vice president from 1953 to 1961. Later on, Nixon would be elected president, by the way, 1968 and 1972. Of course, he's more known for Watergate later, which we'll get to later. He was also a senator from California, very anti-communist. Uh, John F. Kennedy was a Democrat from Massachusetts. He was a senator. He was a war hero. Uh, if you know about this, he was famous for his uh, fight in the Pacific with PT-109. And you've heard about the PT boats. He was a PT captain uh, during the was a tor tor torpedo boats they had they fought in the Pacific, which he has got cut in half. You know about that. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, so yeah, those are the two sides that were running, of course. And one thing that's very famous about uh, the presidential election in 1960, it was one of the first where it was televised a lot, uh, especially the uh, Kennedy Nixon debates. They're really the first major debates they have where. You know, like they were on TV, they were on radio too, uh, also as well. Uh, and uh, so both of them, uh, very young, very very energetic men. Uh, I think they were both in their thirties, uh, both both Kennedy and Nixon. And uh, but they used they used uh, the news media and the, and the television to, to basically bring their message to the American people. That's one thing that they did uh, that was quite different compared to you know, previous elections. And they still had, they had debates before that where presidents, I think, people debated. Uh, for, you know, probably going back to Lincoln. I think they're kind of debating and all that stuff like that. But not a case where, you know, people were watching live uh, these, these you know, debates and things like that. And uh, supposedly about 70 million people actually watched 
the actual Kennedy Nixon debate. That's like all combined. I think there were four of them they had total uh, overall. And I think there's some like, of course, on radio uh, as well. And the issues they talked about mostly have to deal with the economy, military defense, you know, the Cold War era. Those are things that they kind of you know, brought up that were kind of pretty important uh, overall. But there was one thing they kind of talked that kind of Kennedy kind of exploited, if you know about that. Talked about this so-called missile gap, and he blamed Eisenhower's administration for not keeping up, you know, with what what the Soviets were doing, you know, technologically and so on. Uh, and so that that was something that kind of gave him an edge, I know, in some of the debates uh, as well. Also, Kennedy looked more telegenic. If you know about Kennedy, he's a good-looking man. Uh, he was a womanizer, though. He had numerous affairs with different women. I think there's even a case where they think he may have had an affair with uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, if you know about that, and a bunch of other women. Uh, and uh, so he was more telegenic uh, than Nixon was. I think Nixon in some debates looked unshaven. He looked fat or, uh, you know, basically overweight. Uh, and so television really helped Kennedy to win uh, the election. Uh, Kennedy was also backed by his father. If you know about his father was uh, Joseph Kennedy, uh, who was very wealthy. Uh, I think Kennedy had made money going back to the 1920s and 30s. And I think there's even a case where they think his father may have made money off of bootlegging, like illegal alcohol. They've, that's never been proven about that, about his father. His father was also an ambassador, I think, to Britain, I think, around World War II as well, I believe, under FDR. I know that. Uh, there's also this speculation that uh, Kennedy may have also been helped by um, the American mafia. I think there was a deal where I think one of his mistresses was actually um, somehow associated and had been also a lover with one of the, um, I think Sam Giacani, who was actually the mafia in Chicago. Uh, and so some people think that they helped Kennedy get extra votes, which may have been dead people votes or something like that, which they've kind of, that's happened before. They've done this dead people vote thing. It's been around. Uh, but uh, and then JFK also chose, uh, he had uh, his his vice presidential nominee is eventually Lyndon B. Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson, uh, who, by the way, is a very powerful uh, Texas U.S. senator. He's like one of the most powerful senator really in the South. He's kind of important later because he helps to get a lot of the civil rights legislation passed. Uh, when he's in power, and uh, he'll be president later after John F. Kennedy is assassinated in November 1963. So, so that's like basic Kennedy uh, in Nixon. And yeah, that, that election was really, really a close election. You can see here in this map here uh, that uh, Kennedy uh, and uh, Nixon... Of course, I think he had somebody else running, which was, uh, let me see who it was. Oh, yeah, they had Bur Senator Byrd of South Carolina, I think, ran. Actually, West Virginia, I think it was, who ran. But um, anyway, 1960, uh, you can see here that the popular vote was really close. Uh, they think Kennedy got about 34 million, 34.2 million. That was actually the numbers, 34.2 million. Nixon got 34.1 million, just to kind of give you an idea how close the 1960 presidential election. I think there was a talk about maybe Nixon, maybe uh, trying to do what, what Trump did, you know, about that kind of kind of contested or whatever. But he decided to back off on it. Makes you wonder about Illinois, what happened up there uh, with that. But um, I'm not sure if it would have mattered. You know, if, if that would have happened, if, if maybe he'd won Illinois. I don't know. I doubt about that uh, more than anything because the actual electoral votes were not as close. So Kennedy got 303. Nixon got 219, of course, uh, in the election. Now, Kennedy uh, will later go on, of course, to come into power in 1961. Uh, if you know about Kennedy, Kennedy became very famous uh, for his inaugural address uh, that, of course, he did on January the 20th, 1961, uh, where, of course, he made that famous uh, quote. Uh, if you want the full full quote of what he said at the beginning of his speech, he said, let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike, that the torch 
has been passed to a new generation of Americans. Uh, so he kind of talks about that idea. Uh, and um, and he kind of discusses the, you know, uh, so-called new, no, new freedom uh, program or platform that he kind of ran on, you know, about this in 1960, talking about how the torch has been passed. He's talking about, I guess, mostly of these so-called baby boomers that are starting to kind of come of age uh, during this time period uh, here. He also says famously, if you know about Kennedy, he said that famous quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That was the famous quote, of course, in that same speech uh, at the beginning uh, as well. And uh, Kennedy discusses different ideas uh, about what he wants to do uh, with the United States. He talks about expanding the space program. That was one thing he was big on. And uh, like he wanted to expand NASA, do more to help NASA out. Uh, he talks about this idea of putting a man on the moon, uh, which will eventually will come to fruition uh, within about eight years. Uh, so that put NASA on the spot. Now that's going to be important because they'll later put um, more money uh, into putting um, different programs together. And of course, the two most, I think the big programs later you see later, uh, they have. Yeah, the G Gemini and, of course, the Apollo projects, you know, the programs that come out later, those two are kind of important uh, in eventually developing uh, the space program more uh, to eventually put a man on the moon, uh, which they will do uh, in 1969 when Nixon is president of the United States. Uh, there's some other things that Kennedy also talked about, too, uh, that he wanted to do. Uh, with as well. He talks about the idea of some kind of civil rights legislation that they needed uh, in the country uh, to give Amer African Americans more, more equal rights. Uh, so this included, you know, continued desegregation uh, in the South, desegregating schools, uh, desegregating businesses, uh, things like that all over the place. He also wanted to work to, to get also uh, African Americans voting rights. Uh, he actually started a drive in the South. I think if you know about his attorney general, it was Robert Kennedy, uh, who had kind of helped to try to get African-Americans like registered the right to vote and things like that, which just takes a while because you got to have this, you know, the Voting Rights Act that won't come out until later under LBJ uh, that you had. Uh, he also wanted to eradicate poverty, which is something that really doesn't happen yet, but uh, LBJ will kind of try to start doing that. Uh, with his great society programs uh, that he'll have later uh, after Kennedy's gone. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about that later, something he does too. Uh, he also wanted to expand things like unemployment, welfare, food stamps, helped out the impoverished people uh, throughout the United States. Uh, and Kennedy was big, one of his big things he was known for, of course, he cut federal taxes. Uh, starting under his administration. That's something you start seeing later with other presidents starting to cut taxes because at the time, taxes were really high. Uh, going back to Eisenhower's administration and before, I think, I think almost taxed almost a lot of your money, just about. Uh, I think the taxes, I think, were higher back then than they are now today, believe it or not. Uh, also, I don't know if you heard about the Peace Corps, but the Peace Corps was something that Kennedy developed too that's very famous, uh, which Sar Sergeant Shriver actually ran it later, or well, he started under him. And so he's kind of, Kennedy was the father of the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps was this uh, youth program where, uh, you know, young men would go and help out um, third world countries. Uh, I think one of my brother's friends did that one time, I know, uh, who went to like Kenya or something like that, and he was doing stuff. He was like an engineer or something like that, and he helped build certain things to help them out. Uh, and so it was, that was kind of a way to kind of improve third world countries, uh, relations with them, but also to uh, prevent the spread of communism you know, throughout the world. So that's something he did uh, as well. And then also on the environment, I did want to mention, which is something that's also true uh, about Kennedy, uh, was that uh, he also was the one that created the so-called first, you know, environmental type legislation that came out under him, the so-called Clear Air Act of 1963, was really one of the first acts where the U.S. government actually began to regulate and control air pollution, like from cars and plants and things like that they do today. 
And uh, later it'll, it'll be managed and run, you know, by the Environmental Protection Agency, which will not be founded until 1970 uh, when Nixon's uh, in power, which is a little later. So these are all things that Nixon, you know, uh, excuse me, Kennedy was kind of known for uh, as president. Uh, that, that so it's like a very short time. You know, Kennedy Kennedy is not in power, uh, you know, very long. You know, he, as you know, uh, ends up getting assassinated later in 1963. So he did not have a full term, you know, uh, as president. Now, I want to also talk about some of the foreign policy issues that uh, Kennedy had to deal with, of course. Uh, and um, these are some things that Kennedy had to deal with as president, like just a few years he was in power. Uh, you can see, obviously, issues that deal with the Cuba, Soviet Union. There's the main ones, of course. Bay of Pigs invasion. You can see the Berlin crisis was still going on. And of course, you had the building of the Berlin Wall. Uh, was something that, of course, happened uh, that we've kind of already talked about that was you know, eventually built in 1961. Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis also it was another issue. So I've got the wrong year there for some reason again. But 1962, of course, is the Cuban Missile Crisis, actually year uh, when that happened. Let me go ahead and first talk about an issue that became a big, big problem for Kennedy when he came in. And you've probably heard of Fidel Castro, uh, who's kind of famous uh, that they have. Uh, and um, there he is on the left with his brother, Raul, <laughs> uh, who's now the current ruler of uh, communist Cuba today. Uh, and um, anyway, um, basically what happened was previously in Cuba, Fidel Castro uh, around 1959 had seized power uh, what was called the Cuban Revolution. It happened over like a period of like six years uh, and what happened was um, there was this right-wing dictator that the United States supported, which is Fulgencia Batista. We had been supporting him for years. Uh, and Batista was a was a bloodthirsty guy. He had killed, like, I don't know how many Cubans, by the way, like maybe 30,000 or more Cubans at one point. Uh, but uh, we, we supported him because the fact that he was, you know, pro-American. Uh, also, the mafia was in Cuba, as you know. Uh, and they had control, like, of the hotels and the casinos and things like that. And I remember my dad, uh, who uh, used to be in the Air Force uh, around the same time, U.S. Air Force, uh, and uh, he told me how a lot of pilots would actually fly from Florida to Cuba uh, to basically go down there to visit the casinos and all that. And I think he could have gone down there himself, uh, but I think he kind of just decided not to. Uh, but um, but they'd go down. It's like before Castro kind of seized power uh, and all that and ran them all out. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, oh, the men that were involved in it, of course, you got two right there. Of course, Fidel Castro on the left, of course. Uh, and then, of course, Raul Castro. Uh, there was also Che Guevara, you may have heard of, uh, who was also famous. I think I got a picture of those guys all together uh, right here, which uh, Che Guevara is the guy in the middle. He's the one that's got the famous long hair and the beard. Uh, with, he always wear that same kind of cap with him, as you know. He's a big hero today to a lot of people for some reason, even though the guy was a killer. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people killed Che Guevara. Uh, he actually set up firing squads where they mowed people down uh, that were basically against the against the Castro regime. A lot of people don't know that uh, about Che Guevara. He's actually an Argentine doctor who kind of became a Marxist and joined up with the Castro's, um, you know, revolution. Uh, and it was actually called the 26th of July movement, is what they actually called it, uh, it was what they originally. And um, they got a lot of, they got a lot of, uh, you know, people in, you know, Cuba to back him. But a lot of people did not know that Castro was a communist. They did not. Even America did not either. Uh, I think there's even a theory that maybe Che Guevara was the one that kind of converted Castro over. Uh, to be a communist, but uh, they think the real reason that Castro kind of embraced communism was because of the fact that the U.S. wouldn't support them, and so they they relied more on the Soviet Union, which was a communist country. So that's why it, Cuba became this Marxist-Leninist state, you know, uh, afterwards. And of course, it leads to a lot of 
you know, conflicts between us, you know, in, in the United States. Uh, of course, the United States, you know, if you know about it, we tried to kill Castro off like numerous times. I think there was something like 600 something plots uh, to actually kill Castro at one point. Yeah, there was a lot. There was even this program the CIA had called Operation Mongoose uh, that Kennedy backed, which was this this actual secret covert operations uh, to try to kill Cubans that were communists, including Castro. They had all kinds of crazy plots to kill Castro. Like uh, there was one of the exploding cigars where he, because Castro liked cigars, and they thought they come up with this idea of like having a cigar that would blow up in his face and kill him <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. There was one where they uh, he liked to go scuba diving or something like that. And they came up with this idea to put poison inside of a, of a scuba, scuba diving thing, uh, you know, suit or whatever. He would get it and die or something like that. It was kind of a James Bonzi thing, you know, basically. Oh, so that's the new leader now? I don't know. If, okay, so yeah, yeah, I guess so. Now they got a new guy now that's kind of running it. So, yeah, I, I figured that. I, I think it was last year. I thought he was in power, though, as far as I know. Yeah, I just haven't been checking on that. But um, he's probably still really in power, Castro's, you know, because they're so powerful. But um, anyway, um, so, yeah, that was basically uh, that idea. And then um, what happened, if you know, this causes what becomes known as the, um, they call it the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion uh, that follows and uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion was this idea that Eisenhower was supposed to do. Uh, they had plans for it, but for some reason, Eisenhower canceled it uh, until later. And so Kennedy ended up having to deal with it, uh, basically. What was the Bay of Pigs? Uh, the Bay of Pigs was the CIA operation where they, they trained a bunch of uh, Cubans that had fled Cuba. They called themselves anti-Castro Cubans. And many of them were actually trained in Florida, in Guatemala. I think there's even a theory that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald may have been in, involved with Operation Mongoose, which is kind of part of all this uh, that we're talking about, basically. A lot of them were trained in Guatemala, uh, and they were called La Brigada, I think was one of the names they called it, or, or Brigade 2506, I think was another name that they dubbed it. And uh, anyway, uh, they were flown in, uh, you can see there from Guatemala. And then what, what happened was they were going to invade uh, from the south, like the southern part of what is Cuba, where the Bay of Pigs is, which you can kind of see it, which is right here on the map, you know, Bay of Pigs. I guess they were there going to go try to take Havana. Uh, and it just so happens that the Bay of Pigs, you know, Cuba, uh, uh, Castro like to go fishing. I think at one time he was kind of friendly somewhat uh, with um, Ernest Hemingway. I don't think Hemingway ever liked the communists too much, uh, but it was like his big fishing ground. He liked to go fishing there and all that. And uh, anyway, what happened was the thing failed. Uh, the U.S. really didn't give him any air cover or anything like that. Uh, and uh, most of them got captured on the beaches. Uh, and Castro was able to stay in power uh, after that. And so whole thing just blew up in their face. So uh, what ended up happening, Kennedy was embarrassed by it, just totally embarrassed uh, by this whole thing. He, he didn't even know uh, that they were, you know, this was even supposed to happen. Uh, and uh, uh, JFK fa said famously about the Bay of Pigs, he said, victory has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan, <laughs> is what he said. Uh, so he was really embarrassed about the whole thing. And it really, it really didn't really, you know, um, start out well, uh, his administration when he first came. It was like one of the first things they really did. It looked really bad, you know, at that point. All right. So, um, so yeah, that's going on. Uh, then, of course, the other thing that happened when he was there, too, they started building the Berlin Wall, uh, if you know about that, um, which uh, you can see here. Uh, and uh, so the Berlin Wall is starting to be built uh, at that point. And, um, uh, the Berlin Wall uh, was something that they built because uh, if you study about what was kind of going on, uh, was because the fact that people were escaping <laughs> from the Iron Curtain, kind of going under the curtain, I guess, they said to get out. Uh, and so, yeah, like they were talking like a lot of people, like thousands and thousands of people were, were literally just leaving 
uh, the east to go to the west. And of course, one way to do that uh, was to go to what is East Berlin, and you would just cross over to West Berlin, and then I guess fly out. You know, is what you would kind of do uh, to get out. Uh, and so uh, this created eventually the so-called Berlin crisis uh, that I was talking about before, where you had a deal where both sides, you know, had tanks facing each other. Uh, you can see there at Checkpoint Charlie uh, that I've talked, this is in 1961. You have these tanks facing each other. Uh, and I think it's, it looks like, uh, this will be October there. It looks like and October 27th is the day of that picture, I guess, taken uh, pretty much. Uh, and um, and so, yeah, this happens when, you know, basically uh, the East Germans with the Soviets begin building the, Ber the Berlin Wall. It gets erected. Uh, at that point, which the Berlin Wall will, you know, encircle West Berlin. It will be like built around it uh, to prevent anybody uh, from escaping. And uh, as you know, the Berlin Wall uh, became later one of the most famous symbols of the Cold War. Like that's pretty much ever. Uh, and um, until it's, you know, torn down uh, and all that. But it's it's basically up for like the next 30 years almost. Uh, till I think 19, I think 1990, 91 is when they start eventually tearing it down after they basically reunited the two st two German states together, uh, which will happen later. Uh, if you know about Kennedy, Kennedy uh, later uh, came to Berlin. It's something he's kind of famous for. He went to uh, West Berlin and gave a speech uh, in June of 1963, June 26. Uh, you can see there. And, of course, as you know, it's considered, by the way, to be one of the greatest speeches that was probably ever made uh, in in the Cold War. Because uh, if you know about it, he made this famous quote, which I'll, I could throw on the screen for you, but he said the famous quote, Ich bin ein Berliner, which meant I am a Berliner, uh, of course, uh, which became real famous uh, and all that. So it was very, very anti-communist type, type speech. I think the other one that might be closer is Ronald Reagan when Reagan in the 80s, went there and told Gorbachev to tear down that wall. Uh, was the other big speech, I guess. It was kind of similar uh, to that. So it's a very, very anti-communist type speech. Uh, it was, of course, obviously a type of speech uh, that was created uh, to give support to West Germany, uh, that we were their ally. We were there to support them uh, against the communists in East Germany and all that. Uh, and so that's why that was considered to be such a great speech, uh, more or less. Uh, there is an urban legend that uh, when he said that famous quote, I am a Berliner, he was really saying, I am a jelly donut. Because uh, apparently uh, in Germany, there was some kind of donut that was called a Berliner. Uh, but apparently it's not something that they say in Berlin. Uh, so it's not true. So that's, that's something that they always kind of joke about. That he was saying that I'm a jelly donut. <laughs> and so they're kind of laughing, I guess, when he said it too, which is makes you wonder if maybe they thought it was. I don't know. But uh anyway, uh, of course, the peak of the Cold War. I'll also, of course, talk about the other big issue that happened under Kennedy as well, was of course the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis that happened in 1962. Uh, that's the other big thing. Uh and um what happened in uh, 1962 is that the United States discovered that the Soviet Union uh, had placed missiles in Cuba because, uh, uh, you know, the Soviets were trying to protect Castro because uh, they were thinking that the United States might try to invade again because, you know, we tried to invade with the you know, Bay of Pigs invasion uh, and all that. And so the part of why we discovered, you know, these missiles, you know, again, we talk about the U-2 plane again, the U-2 spy plane, of course, used again. I actually saw one a few weeks ago when I went to see the U.S. Alabama. I saw, saw a U-2 uh, that was actually there at site. It's pretty neat. Uh, and it um, has these really long wings to them. And, uh, but, um, but yeah, because of the, the U, U-2 spy planes, you know, we discover, you know, that there's these missiles uh, that are on Cuba that they've got. And you can kind of see that picture there right there, but it's going to lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which will last close to a month between October to November of 1962. Uh, and um, 
it became a really big controversy. I think if you can study about uh, what happened uh, in in with this whole issue, uh, it even became like a big deal in the UN, like in the United Nations Assembly. Uh, they start arguing with each other, almost like a big confrontation uh, between each other. And Adley Stevenson, he was the uh, ambassador at the time, uh, said he was willing to wait until hell freezed over until they told him if there were missiles or not there. Uh, so it became a really big, big issue uh, that blew up uh, in the UN. Uh, and uh, what uh, what eventually happened was that uh, John F. Kennedy uh, decided that the best thing that they could do was to blockade Cuba, like to kind of quarantine them, uh, basically, where they would blockade the whole coast, kind of like the Spanish-American War, something like that they did before, and then force the Soviets either to try to break the blockade or try to obviously back down. Uh, with that. Uh, and so uh, they came very, very close uh, to really World War III breaking out uh, in 1962. Uh, I think there was even a case where there's, I think there was like a Soviet sub that was thinking about firing at one of our naval ships, but they decided not to. Uh, and so uh, Khrushchev eventually backed down. That's one thing that did happen, you know. Uh, and so they eventually decided that they had to remove the missiles, which they would. And then we actually kind of, in return, we actually removed missiles that were in Turkey, which the Soviets didn't like, thought that was too close to the Soviet Union. So we kind of did that tit for tat to kind of, you know, prevent basically, uh, you know, nuclear war from happening. Uh, if you know what happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis, one thing that occurred that's very, very famous, uh, they actually created this um, hotline that's between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. It's actually called the Moscow-Washington Hotline, they called it. And uh, and that, that allowed to create direct communication between both sides to prevent crises or to prevent, like, nuclear war from break, breaking out. You've probably seen Hollywood movies where they kind of use that or make fun of it. I think the movie Dr. Strangelove, if you've ever seen that movie, kind of makes fun of it. And they always talk about the red phone. There's no red phone. It doesn't exist. <laughs> That's some Hollywood invented. Now, most people don't know that about the red phone. But anyway, but that's something that Kennedy had to deal with greatly. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today, which is, of course, very, very famous well, with John F. Kennedy. As you know, <laughs> one thing that happened with Kennedy, uh, he, of course, was eventually assassinated. Well, of course, the fourth president uh, to, of course, be killed. Uh, out of the ones we talked about before. And uh, what happened was how this kind of came about uh, was in 1963, uh, John F. Kennedy was campaigning for re-election. Uh, and so he was going to Texas uh, because he was kind of trying to shore up Southern votes uh, because of the fact that Kennedy was kind of pro-civil rights and I think a lot, a lot of white Southerners weren't kind of supportive of him. Uh, and so that's why he went to Fort Worth and Dallas, I guess the two big cities that were in Texas uh, at the time. Uh, and um, as you know, as he his motorcade was going through uh, what is downtown uh, Dallas, uh, he, of course, was shot. Uh, and uh, basically this, uh, if you know, it was not just him, it was in Daly Plaza, of course, where it took place. Uh, Kennedy and also governor, the governor of Texas was also shot too. I think in the leg, John Connolly, uh, both were shot and Kennedy was eventually killed. It, he, I think he lived maybe an hour or less afterwards. It probably, probably pretty much uh, out of it unconscious, uh, but he died at Parkland hospital in Dallas, Texas, eventually leading to Lyndon B. Johnson becoming president, the 36th president, of course, uh, of the United States. And so this became known as the so-called Kennedy assassination, uh, as they call it, of course, today. I do have some videos, of course, on this particular incident, of course, that occurred. Um, I'll kind of show you one that's kind of interesting about the limousine, of course, that was Kennedy was, was riding in of when he was killed. Apparently, they kept using it afterwards, even though he was dead. This is kind of crazy, but they, but they did. It's been said every car tells a story, and this one recalls the day, the moment America lost a president. 
Five decades later, JFK's limousine remains one of the most powerful symbols of that day. The convertible the president and first lady were riding in through Dallas, a 1961 four-door Lincoln Continental. Big, beautiful Lincoln. Nearly 50 years after those shots rang out in Dealey Plaza, there was now near silence when people see that car, where it now sits at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. We all have images of that day burned into our, our minds, and every one of those images includes that car. It's such a, a vital and, and intimate part of, of the assassination. I mean, that's where the president's life essentially ended, so people are, are really drawn to it. So many asking those what-ifs. What if the car was moving faster? What if the bubble top had been on it? The limousine had no armor when the president was assassinated. It was brought back to Washington, studied for evidence by the Secret Service and the FBI. It was refurbished with new titanium armor, a permanent top added. It was put back into the presidential fleet, driven until the 1970s. It was codenamed X-100, though Americans only saw it on black and white TV. That Lincoln limo was actually of midnight blue. It's been said President Kennedy did not like the bubble top, and when the rain cleared that fateful Friday, the bubble was removed as the sun emerged in Dallas. Standing orders in the Kennedy White House where any time the weather would permit it, that roof came off. What is unclear all these years later is whether that top, which wasn't bulletproof, would have made any difference on that day, November 22nd, 1963. And the museum told us late today that Clint Hill, the First Lady's Secret Service agent who jumped out of the car that day, will revisit the limo this week. So a little course video on that course on the limo. So yeah, they kept using it afterwards, even though he had been killed. Uh, you can hear see by the way, Daily Plaza, which is in da the downtown area in Dallas, uh, the actual, they think the shots came from this uh, Texas Book uh, Depository building, which is right here. I think they say this window here about uh, is where uh, Kennedy was killed. Like this is the Texas Book School Depository building, which is right here. I think the window right here maybe is where the shots came from. Uh, although they think there was like this so-called grassy knoll, which is over kind of over here. There may have been shots over here because... There's been a debate about whether there were two gunmen or not uh, that were involved uh, in the Kennedy assassination. Uh, and um, the, uh, there was actually a man that was arrested like right after uh, Kennedy, of course, was shot, which was this man named Lee Harvey Oswald, who, by the way, was from Louisiana. He was from New Orleans. That's where he was from. Uh, and he had been like this ex-Marine uh, that, uh, apparently was a pro-Marxist uh, who had actually gone to the Soviet Union at one point. He did. He lived there in the Soviet Union for a couple of years and then came back. Uh, and um, anyway, supposedly he killed a, a Dallas police officer uh, right after uh, as well. And he was held, he was held by the um, actually police. They were trying to interrogate him. And all that. And I think famously, if you know about Oswald, he said famously that I am a patsy, uh, is what he stated. Uh, so you got to wonder if maybe there was more men behind the assassination than uh, you might have been. He probably was involved in it, maybe quite possibly. They, they do think. Uh, they think that maybe more than one people uh, were definitely involved. Uh, strangely, if you know what happened, he was shot himself. Oswald would later be killed by uh, this man named Jack Ruby, who was a Dallas nightclub. I mean, he had this nightclub called the Carousel Club. Uh, and he actually shot, he actually shot him on live, live TV. I'll kind of, I'll kind of show you kind of a short video uh, of that. Uh, but yeah, that's a famous event that also happened too uh, with, with the Kennedy assassination as well. So that of course is Jack, Jack Ruby, of course, a man that would of course would shoot uh, Oswald. So that was kind of strange uh, about that whole issue. Uh, of course, there's been a debate about, you know, what was the deal with those two men? I think there's a theory uh, that Oswald and Ruby knew each other. And so uh, Ruby went to kill him so he wouldn't talk. Uh, it's been, they speculated. Uh, of course, Ruby claimed that the reason why he did it uh, was he didn't want uh, Mrs. Kennedy to have to, to, I guess, show up to the trial and all that. Uh, but I don't know if I believe that, believe it or not. Because some people think the mafia was in on it, uh, on, on this whole thing. Uh, now, of course, if you know much about the Kennedy assassinate, they had this thing called the Warren Commission that uh, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, would kind of form afterwards to investigate uh, the assassination. 
And uh, they basically said that Oswald had acted alone. He was a lone gunman, uh, basically. Uh, and But even after they said that he was the one that did it, even though he was dead, all these conspiracies that later came out, uh, that, that came out with the whole Kennedy assassination. As you know, the whole Kennedy assassination is one big, big, big conspiracy, which is still kind of going on. He would still think there's all kinds of crazy theories about that. And even though it happened in Louisiana, there was this guy named Jim Garrison, who was a New Orleans district attorney. He actually kind of reopened the investigation into it in 1967, actually, is when it was. And he claimed that this guy named Clay Shaw was kind of involved, who was from New Orleans, and he actually put him on trial for it. And Shaw, uh, well, Garrison believed that the uh, CIA uh, had been some, somehow kind of involved uh, in killing Kennedy off. Because uh, I think there was even some cases where they arrested some men uh, right after the site where, where Kennedy was shot. And some think they were working with the CIA or FBI, one of the two. I think, some people think the FBI may have been involved. But they're not sure. Speculation on it. Uh, these are all the popular theories, by the way, that may have also happened. They think Castro may have gotten to Kennedy or Kennedy got to Castro. They've talked about that idea uh, also as well. Of course, the mafia may have killed Kennedy. Carlos Marcello, of course, from New Orleans, uh, of course, uh, may have also been been involved too. I remember reading a book called Mafia Kingfish or something like that. They called him, uh, and he may have been basically a guy that could have planned it. I think there's even some evidence that he even made some statements that he may have planned it and you know, all that or something like that possibly. Uh, of course, some people say LBJ killed him. Uh, to get power, you know, because and all that. And so I think they had this theory. I know they, they talk about sometimes that Kennedy was going to withdraw troops from Vietnam and the military wanted to go into Vietnam. And so they think that may, may have killed him for that reason, too, as well. So we'll never know, probably, uh, who was behind it. I know. I know some of the different secrets are still kind of sealed up uh, that will eventually be revealed. I know later whenever things get later in the future, but uh, the Kennedy assassination is still a big mystery today, you know, about who killed him. I think there's even a case where the U.S. House of Representatives investigated it years later uh, and discovered that there probably was more than one gunman likely. So that's something they think they think pretty much now is probably true, more or less. So anyway, uh, I think I'm going to stop here lecture-wise today. Of course, next week I'm going to, of course, get into, I'm going to kind of continue talking about the 60s. We'll kind of talk about Lyndon B. Johnson's administration because he does a lot of things on the 60s, you know, especially with civil rights and so on. But it's kind of contaminated by the Vietnam War, uh, which I'll get into as well. And so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the Nixon era and Watergate as well. And I'll kind of keep continuing from there because next week we'll kind of continue from the 1960s up to the present. So I'll probably have two lectures kind of trying to cover whatever we can uh, at the end of the semester because we only got one week left, of course, uh, for classes. So that's